I am here with Dr. Jeff in Costa Rica at Rhythmia. Yep. And we're approaching the fourth ceremony here, the fourth plant medicine ceremony. Right. And I'm pumped to talk with you because we're going to be discussing some of the science behind plant medicine and how that can help people experience the growth of new brain cells, new neural connections, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and tap into higher states of consciousness. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. So for the people who are just joining us, which is everyone, um, <laughs> give us a little bit of, take us back to 2014. Where were you personally and professionally in your life? 2014, I was uh, the administrative director of a rehab, and I was uh, working in a private practice, and I was, uh, you know, in and out of all kinds of healthcare agencies, inpatient psychiatric hospitals. I was uh, working with really high-risk people, so people with trauma, mostly women that had been victimized, and I was working with addicts and acute psychiatric people, you know, so I was like in this totally all these different environments, and you know, a lot of my patients were um, on a ton of meds, and they were always in and out of places, you know, and it's just like, I wasn't really seeing a whole lot of improvement. They would kind of get to a certain level and then it would just stop. And I saw a lot of uh, overdose and a lot of suicides and just a lot of unhappiness and just, I was really frustrated to tell you the truth, you know, because I've been in healthcare for 25 years. I have a master's in public health from UCLA and I have a doctorate in psychology and I have a medical background, like managing health agencies and hospitals type stuff. So I was just like really upset, you know, and just getting frustrated basically. So you felt like the, the, the tools that you had and the system that you were working within was uh, questionably effective? Yeah, it's like all the tools I learned in school um, had, you know, they would work for some people, you know, but the bottom line was is that, you know, these tools are all external sources of change for people. It's like it wasn't causing the internal shift in any of the patients that I had. And I guess in theory what's supposed to happen is you learn tools and you apply them and then you're supposed to create a shift in you. And I guess that's sort of the rationale behind it. But, you know, the people I was working with, like they were very depressed and had tons of anxiety and maybe had addictions. They just weren't able to use the tools effectively to get to that point. Because those tools take a really long time. You know, and therapy takes a many, many years. If you know, they ever work. If they ever work. So it was just kind of like, you know, it was all theoretical really for me. Like it just wasn't working. Like the practical stuff was not happening for the patients. Were, were you seeing people take their lives? Like what were, what were some of the consequences besides a compromised quality of life that, that you were seeing that made you explore other options or search, seek out a better way? Well, I was, luckily I was always pretty open-minded to different stuff and I was always rebellious as a kid and even as an adult and still am to some degree, you know, and I always was like, I didn't ever really trust the system of healthcare or the system of society, to tell you the truth. Like I was always like a rebel in there, you know, growing up in Los Angeles, I was always a punk kid doing crazy stuff, you know, and not trusting anybody. So I always wanted to see things for myself and, and experience them myself. And you know, I think what happens, because I had that sort of rebellious vibe, I was always trying to see like if the, if the healthcare, you know, if the AMA or the Board of Psychology or all these different agencies that I had to work within, if they were like, you know, you can't do something, I was always like, I want to see what that is. You know, I want to look at that. You know, whether it's an alternative method or, you know, energy work, plant medicine, I'd heard a little bit about it. You know, I didn't know a ton, but I was always trying to kind of see what else was out there. And take us back to the moment where things started to change. Well, uh, I met Jerry, the CEO of Rhythmia, when he came into Passages, and I was the administrative director of that at, at that time too. And what was Passages happening is a, is a, is a rehab. Okay. It's in Malibu. Right. And I wasn't working with people because um, I was managing the facility, but I decided that this guy was so rough and so brutal and just an animal, basically, <laughs> is that I didn't really trust, I didn't want to turn him over to my treatment team because he would have just tore him up, you know. I'm like, I, I'll just, I'll take, I'll take the bullet, I'll, I'll work with this guy, you know, myself and give the staff a break. And, and uh, so we actually hit it off. We had a lot in common. It was pretty well, weird. What was he like? For, for to help people understand. <sighs> wow. Well, when I met him, he was at the end of his rope. I mean, he had, he had attempted suicide recently, 
he was a full-blown Demerol addict, which is a, a, a surgical uh, quality morphine. You know, they use it in surgery. And, you know, cocaine addict, and he was angry. He was always fighting people. He was also really sad and upset because his wife was about to leave him and take his kids. And he was just distraught. You know, he didn't know what else to do. Like, he, he, he definitely didn't want to be in rehab, but he kind of, like, made himself go. And he was just pissed, basically. <laughs> yeah, and for people listening who maybe don't resonate with being in that position, um, this is these are tools that also apply to people who are just on a personal development oh, yeah. journey and looking to yeah. kind of move into uh, higher states of yeah. living. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, and, and yeah, there's a lot of people that come here that have you know like they're they're not happy in their career choice. Mm -hmm. You know, they've maybe got 10 years or 20 in their career. They want to make a change. Not sure what. Um, they have maybe an idea. There's people that come for clarity. People who go through um, divorce or separation, they come here a lot because um, they need to like, just feel good about themselves again. You know, we have anxiety, clients, depression, you know, all kinds of people like on a life journey. Not everybody's all extreme like that. You know, Jerry was sort of an exception in a way. Which makes his story awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His story is really cool, you know, because it was such an extreme shift. But, mm -hmm. you know, most of our guests, like I'd say, you know, 70% of them are on this kind of self-realization path, you know? Right. Yeah. So you and Jerry, you, you, you start working with Jerry and uh, starting out to try to just take a bullet, take some of the pressure off yeah. of your team, yeah. and then you guys hit it off. Yeah, yeah, and he, and he was able to get rid of his Demerol addiction like while he was at Passages, which is a really big deal because you know opiate addiction is, is hard right. for people at all the levels, all the different opiates, and he was able to kick that at Passages. That was huge, but he's funny because he was like, I'm not here for the cocaine or the women or the this or the that, the drinking, I'm just for my Demerol, so I was like, dude. <laughs> Pick and choose which yeah. get rid of. So when he left the rehab, you know, he was out. He moved to Malibu from Pennsylvania, and he just kept doing all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, he wasn't doing Demerol, but he was partying and acting like a madman, getting into fights. And so he wanted to still work with me, but I couldn't work with him as as the director of passages because he had to be a patient there. Mm -hmm. So he's like, "Come with me, quit passages, leave, come do your thing." I was like, "Well, you know, circumstances presented themselves. It was like time for me to go." Yeah. So I split. I started, you know, kind of doing like coaching work with him yeah. and just trying to work with him. I worked with him every day for five years. Wow. There were five days a week for five years. How long each day? About six hours. <laughs> Dude, I should have killed myself. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's like your magnum opus. It was brutal. You know, he would make some, some realizations, but none of it would stick. Yeah. Like, he'd kind of have a little breakthrough. It would be good for like three days. Then he'd be back to his same old behavior. And he was getting all upset again. And he was like, I'm going to kill myself. I'm like, dude, don't, don't do that, bro. Like, you know, that's not cool. Like, let's, you know, I, I had met with his family in the meantime. I knew him. I was like, your family, you know, your kids are going to be, that's not good. So he's like, all right, so... He wanted a, a, took a vacation basically, and then he heard about plant medicine. So uh, he had like a, on a whim, he just decided, I'll, I'll try this because I tried everything else, you know. Because during those five years, I had him trying to do all kinds of stuff, going to spiritual stuff and trying to exercise and mindfulness and you know all kinds of stuff. None of it was none of it worked. Talk therapy, none of it worked. So he did plant medicine like on a whim, and it just like completely shifted him. And that's where I started to kind of look at what all this world of you know plant stuff was about right when i saw him shift what did you see in him all of his pain and his his guilt were gone and his his uh way of thinking was really different instead of like this negative stuff that he was thinking of all the time he was all of a sudden really positive but in a in a balanced way not like a crazy sort of ridiculous way that's out in the clouds he was just more rational and just great. He just looked different. He looked like a different person. And his his first experience with plant medicine was with I I iboga. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It was, and that so was mine. Was with iboga. Yeah. Yeah. Which is usually for addicts, but uh, ibogaine is the plant medicine that's for addicts. That's the one alkaloid that's in the full plant that they isolate out and use for for opiate addiction. But if you take the full plant which has 13 alkaloids, then there's uh, more of a psycho-spiritual component to it. Mm -hmm. You have a journey, like how people do with ayahuasca. 
Mm -hmm. So there's like all this connection debt. Yeah, we've, so uh, many of our friends are entrepreneurs and executives, and that was my first exposure to ibogaine and ayahuasca mm -hmm. and, and dimethyltryptamine DMT yeah. Yeah. was through them. Uh, exploring these things as, as a way to take their their personal life and their businesses to their full potential. Yeah. Um, so, how did how did Jerry convince you to get involved with <laughs> in this stuff? I I was super reluctant because I'm like, you know, I'm I'm already working with people. I've done a lot of therapy. You know, my own therapy. I've I you know I was I thought I was pretty okay. Like, I don't feel like I needed all, you know, that breakthrough thing. I was wrong. I was dead wrong. I totally didn't need it. And, and I was terrified when I went into the ceremony with the shaman. I'm like, I don't even know why I'm doing this. Jerry just wants me to do it. I'll respect that. I'll try it. You know, it's, I saw him change, and he needed the change. I don't need the change. You know, I was kind of like that. And it completely changed my life, completely. Yeah. For the better. Yeah. How? Well... I grew up in a part of Los Angeles in the 70s that was not a nice area. Nearby was nice. You know, LA is interesting because it's all these pockets of nice and then not so nice. And I was in an area that was rough. And I grew up with like a lot of violence around me and a lot of like sketchy people, a lot of drugs and just gang stuff happening around. And uh, in order to be safe, I had to put on this sort of shell of like, I'm a badass, I'm a tough guy don't mess with me. You know, and that's how I kind of maneuvered in the street and like in society. Like, I'm just this badass guy, like just, you don't want to mess with me, right? And it worked, it worked really well. Like when they talk about getting thrown in jail and pick a fight with the biggest guy in there. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> that would have been me. Like I would have gone up to the, punch the guy, like that kind of thing, right? Yeah. And when I, would, I grew up surfing and when I would surf, I'd always be fighting in the water and it was just bad, dude. I was just, you know, I was an angry person, really. And uh, what I realized on plant medicine is that I got to go and sort of visit my little Jeff when I was about five years old. And I went and found myself in my neighborhood. You know, he was cruising around on a little skateboard. I was like, hey dude, what's up? And he just ran off. I had to chase him. He didn't want anything to do with me. So I, I just, I eventually got him. I'm like, and I made him talk to me. I'm like, dude, what is going on? Why, why are you acting this way? And why am I this way? He's like, I'm scared. I'm just scared of this neighborhood. I'm scared of all these people here. I'm scared of the unpredictability around every corner. I'm scared of hearing these gunshots. I'm scared of that guy that got knifed down the road. Like, I'm just scared. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. That makes sense. And it just clicked. <laughs> and it wasn't some brain surgeries, rocket science answer. It was just like, I was scared at a young age. I had to survive. I felt vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that's how I coped, by being tough and unapproachable. And I realized like I was still that way as an adult. It, it was toned down, but I was still angry. I was still like tough guy. I would intimidate people. I had, a, I had a supervisor in my doctoral program. At the end of the year, because it's a one year internship, you do four or three or four of them, and you, you get a final evaluation. And I said, all right, dude, so like, you know, what's up with me? He's like, tell you the truth, I was terrified of you all year. I'm like, what? So yeah, you're an intimidating guy, and you need to know this because you're working with people that are vulnerable, and you're a scary dude. I was like, whoa, huh? Trip <laughs> out? I didn't even know. <laughs> so I kind of gave me a clue, but then the, the the plant medicine really made me see that. I'm like, dude, that's not my real self. Like I'm not some guy that likes to fight or be a jerk or be angry. Like that's just not who I am. You know, who I am is a nice guy. I like to help people. I have, I'm a protector, you know, and that's still that part of me that I have, like I am able to protect people, and I do that here at Rhythmia, like I protect the staff, I protect the guests, I protect the space, I still am me, but I do it in a way that's full, like out of love, as opposed to anger and fear, mm -hmm. just a different approach. Or like avoidance of, of some potential yeah, threat. Exactly, because now there's no threats really. You know, yeah. if, I, if I go down to some bad neighborhood, maybe and I'll turn that on if I need it, but I don't usually walk around the hood anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's, there's an aspect to utilizing these tools that, as you mentioned, it doesn't have to be a massive breakthrough. Correct. All that has to happen is a light of awareness gets switched on. Yeah. 
And you know, someone may be hearing that story and be like, "Yeah, of course you were scared. That's obvious." Totally. But if your if your awareness wasn't uh, mindful of that, yeah, then it, it was it was just operating in your subconscious mind yeah. and affecting every decision that you made and every you totally. know the way that you approached every relationship. Yeah, and, and it and was person. You know? That's right. And the key is that I was able to feel it myself in my soul. Yeah. As opposed to just hearing it, like you know, a therapist told me. Oh yeah, well, you know, yeah, trauma as a child, that's why you did it. I'm like, oh, whatever, just went, whatever. Like, I didn't, it didn't resonate. Right. But the plant medicine allowed it to resonate with me. So after that, that first uh, ibogaine or iboga, iboga, iboga uh, ceremony, what what shifts did you start experiencing in your life? What were some of the, the changes that you were witnessing? I was better with my kids. I was uh, more present. I was less angry with people. My temper was like gone. I used to be on like a hair trigger, I could get pissed really fast. That was done. I uh, enjoyed things more. I slowed down. You know, I just kind of appreciated like what was going on for me. In LA, you know, I used to drive from uh, from the marina or Venice. I used to drive from there all the way to Pasadena for work. And that's brutal, right? The 10 to the 5 to the 2 to the 210. <laughs> And I was, I was like, just I was like, like, LA like dude, a week and a half ago. That was like horrible. It would take me like two hours each way. You'll get in the car and it'll say it's like something's 90 minutes away and it's like two and a half hours later. I'm like, what is this? Plate tectonics? What's going on? Yeah, right it's now? crazy, right? <laughs> the 405. I mean, it's just a nightmare, right? But and I would always be like super on edge. Yeah. You know, you know I could leave, have to leave at like five in the morning. It was just it sucks, right? But then after playing this, I was like, Dude, I'm gonna listen to some cool music on the way, or I'm gonna listen to you know sports talk radio. I can listen to that, listen to Laker Channel or whatever. You know, I was just like enjoy. I'm like, this is my time to be with me and to meditate and to think of stuff, and I loved it. I looked forward to it after that. Was weird. Yeah, you mentioned something about like the the pause. Yeah, you know, not like immediately getting getting upset or getting aggressive or whatever. Yeah, and my brother was talking about that last night. Like one of the things that he's discussed with me that had been uh, it, it negatively impacting his life is he's like, I would see like a beautiful woman and I'd be like, he's like, I would turn into like a werewolf. I'd be like, <laughs> and And he's like, I, but I don't like that. He's yeah. like, that's not where I want to come from. Yeah. And he's like, in just a couple days, he's like, it's allowed me to pause and just like appreciate another human being yeah. for their their beauty inside and their physical beauty, but it's coming from a different place. Yeah, it's not yeah. coming from a place of reacting yeah. or um, or attachment. Yeah, exactly. Um, cool. It's very nice. How did things transition from uh, Iboga to ayahuasca? So uh, Jerry and I did multiple journeys with the, with Iboga. And Iboga is different than ayahuasca in the sense that you can uh, write out questions and, and you can ask yourself, like your soul, these questions, right? And a lot of them were, you know, what should we use with these guests? What place should we buy? How much should we offer to buy it for? You know, all these business questions. After we'd done all of our personal sort of work, we would do these journeys that were about the business. You know, like what plant medicine should we use here? Yeah. And it said ayahuasca. It said ayahuasca. So we're like, why? Because like, <laughs> it'll it'll create more of a light worker, light healer vibe for the guests, and it'll be something that you can manage a little bit better. Because Iboga is pretty hardcore. I've like, heard this. Yeah, Iboga Iboga is like amazing. I mean, it's my favorite plant medicine. But uh, to have big groups and do Iboga is is a little challenging. And so uh, we were able to have a, a big place. You know, we can we have we can hold like ninety six people here, and we can do we can manage a ceremony you know that's bigger like for the I think this week you guys have like fifty or sixty people here or something like I don't exactly know sixty plus and that's manageable we can do it and the plant medicine just was a better vibe for like what we're accomplishing in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've I've heard some of the, some of the more challenging plant medicine experiences have all involved a boga yeah. where it seems like people get through it and then have massive breakthroughs. Yeah. But that process of going through it. Yeah, it's rough. Is trying. It is. It and is. did you have a long time? Yes. So like ayahuasca, the half-life's two to four hours. Mm -hmm. like if you drink once, 
two to four hours, you're pretty much it's over. You know, now the, the residual effects linger, but um, you boga, you take one capsule, one gram capsule, it's like 12 hours, 24 hours. Oh my dear God. Yeah, so we, <laughs> so we wanted to have, right? Uh, we wanted to have integration classes. We wanted to have people be able to do yoga, get a massage, right. you know, have some training. And that would have been really hard if people were on boga for a week, mm -hmm. you know, so it just matches better like what we wanted to accomplish. I, I can't imagine, there's a part of me that, that is interested in trying a boga, but then even like last night, we started with a double, right? So everyone else was doing one, we did two. Round two went up, did another double. And I was sitting by the fire and I was like, I'm not feeling anything, you know? <laughs> and, and Raven sat down next to me and I'm like, Raven, I'm probably gonna regret saying this, but I kind of just want to get my ass kicked. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and and so she gets up and she goes. Sarah said to go get some more. So I went up and I did some more, and then laid down, and it was just like <sighs> that blasted you off. Four hours. Yeah. And I was I was there like I'm exhausted, <laughs> and it felt like it it was like meditating while being challenged in a way that I've never uh, challenged. Uh, yeah. And it's like, you realize like our, our state is within our control. Yes. And it's like how we interpret the situation. So I find myself and I'd be like, oh, I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to be uncomfortable. And then I was like, you talk about being outside of your comfort zone. This is it, bro. Yeah, yeah. You know, like yeah. how do you, how do you ease into that? And yeah. like accept it rather than just sitting here resisting it. But Four hours felt like it felt like I was in there forever. Yeah, <laughs> I cannot imagine twelve hours. It's rough, man. Yeah. It's rough. Um, it's super amazingly therapeutic and helpful, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's asking a lot. You know, it's challenging. How, how would you con compare and contrast your experiences with iboga and ayahuasca? Iboga, they call it the stern grandfather. Okay. And, I, and ayahuasca is the mother. So Masculine, it's, feminine. Yeah. So a stern grandfather, if he's managing the grandkids, how is he usually, a stern one? Right to the point, don't do that, do this, da da da, -da. you're being stupid. <laughs> you know, change, 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 right? Yeah. Um, but what's more maternal? Loving, we're gonna, we're gonna show you some stuff, maybe we're gonna be symbolic, it's gonna be big picture stuff, it's gonna be, you gotta figure it out for yourself, I'm show, point you in the right direction kind of thing, it's just like more of a feminine energy. And I found that to be definitely the case between those two. Yeah, so let's talk about some of the science behind plant medicine, specifically ayahuasca, mm -hmm. and what we're seeing in terms of new neural pathways, neurogenesis, and then some of the other stuff that, that you're uh, witnessing in the scientific literature. Cool, so um, the amygdala part of the brain, right, is where we store our subconscious memories. And if I have a trauma at age five, let's say a dog, is gonna bite me or attack me and I'm five. I build a neuron pathway that says, basically has two things, has um, dogs on it and it has fear. So dogs are scary and that gets burned into my amygdala. And so then anytime, and that's for survival. That's like an evolutionary thing for survival, right? Which makes sense. Totally. So then every time I see a dog, I'm scared because mm -hmm. I have this traumatic experience with one. It's almost like a, an emotional anchor. Like it, yeah. it, it, it anchors an emotion to a real world stimulus. Definitely, yes. Okay. So then, I'm not five, I'm 50, and I still don't like dogs, I'm afraid of dogs, or I just don't like dogs. And I don't know why, because it's kind of weird. Because five was 45 years ago, so I don't really even remember that. And I'm just kind of like confused, like all these people like dogs, and dogs seem to be nice, but I'm just like, I don't want anything to do with them. So I'll do ayahuasca. My amygdala, where my subconscious memories are stored in my neuron pathways that are there for that, connects with the prefrontal cortex, which is our rational cognitive part of the brain. And they get to link up and communicate. And the prefrontal cortex goes, dude, you were scared at age five when that pit bull tried to attack you and bit your brother. You don't wanna, you know, that's why you have this aversion to dogs. Dogs aren't gonna attack you now. You're not living in the hood with pit bull fights. <laughs> so <laughs> there's no pit bulls around here. Dogs are nice. And then you have this emotion of fear come up and it just goes right out and it's gone. And then a neuron pathway gets adjusted 
It's like dogs aren't fear or scary. Dogs are nice. Dogs are cool. Dogs are loving. And that's the new thing that builds. And synaptic plasticity occurs. And then what happens is the dopamine, the synaptic, synaptic plasticity, synaptic is like plasticity, brain flexibility. Correct. The, yeah. build, the ability to create and generate new neuron pathways. Right. Yeah. And so they used to think the brain was rigid after a certain age. And it is in certain areas and certain things. But there's this component of the brain that it is adjustable and you can kind of like create new sort of awarenesses and new neuron pathways just through all kinds of different techniques. You know, plant medicine is one of them. It's really cool. Very cool. What else are we seeing? Are we have we done um, have we done brain scans? Is are are there changes in blood flow? Like, what are some of the other things that you've seen in the science? Yeah, um, that are pretty exciting. They have, the reason there's not a lot of research on ayahuasca is because it's a Schedule One substance in most of the world, which means you can't study it, which is a shame. Which is why we're not in Los Angeles. That's right. right. That's why we're in Costa Rica. Yeah, <laughs> beautiful Costa Rica. So. Um, However, there have been a few studies, mostly um, there's a couple in Europe, and they just basically, the brain scans that they've done show the parts of the brain that are activated. You know, it has the colors, and it shows like activity of the brain. It's like, it's heat based. Mm -hmm. And they're showing the amygdala being really active, and then again, the prefrontal cortex. And the part that they have been able to study is that, uh, you know, for example, if I have depression, there's two reasons why I might have depression. One is because I just genetically have low dopamine. Mm -hmm. Or I might create low dopamine by lifestyle choice. Alcohol abuse, for example, creates a low dopamine. Mm -hmm. And other addictions do. And also bad eating and living in a smog-filled city or thinking negative. All this affects dopamine, right? Mm -hmm. So there's another part of depression, which is just my behavioral choices. I have bad coping tools. Or I, you know, I'm in an abusive environment or all this different kind of stuff. So what happens is my dopamine's all screwed up, let's say. Mm -hmm. When I do plant medicine, when I do ayahuasca, the dopamine gets reset in the neurochemical synaptic, uh, synaptic cleft. So the synaptic cleft is the neurons in the brain and in the spinal cord, they don't touch each other. And so dopamine gets to flood in here and create a, uh, a chain of reaction. And if I have low dopamine, it causes this like depression stuff and high, Serotonin is, is anxiety, usually. Mm -hmm. It's more complicated than that, but that's just a basic way to kind of understand it. Ayahuasca resets five key serotonin receptors and works with key dopamine ones. And so what happens is, so my depression after a, um, ceremonies of ayahuasca, it's gone for two reasons. Because my neurochemistry got balanced again, and I was able to overcome the behavioral stuff that was kind of holding me back. That's that show me who I've become intention that we have. Like I see that I'm coping with life in a negative way and there's other ways to do it that are better. And so that part gets resolved and the neurochemical part gets resolved. That's why it's powerful. It's fascinating. It's, it's almost like, it's kind of like we're living, if you've ever flipped a breaker, yeah, right? Yeah. And it's like over time, various different things from infections to lifestyle choices to the fact that many of us are living in urban environments and more disconnected from people than we've ever been despite electronic yeah. devices yeah, giving yeah. us the, the false sense that we're connected. Totally. Um, and it's like these breakers get flipped. Yeah. And you now have this uh, electrical system that's only partially working. Yes. And then you come here and ayahuasca goes in and goes Exactly. And puts those breakers back online. Yeah. yeah. And um, and and what you know, one of the things that in, in doing some research before coming here, because I was like you, I was like, I think I need this. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. Me, but uh, obviously I do. Um, <laughs> and uh, doing some research, like you 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 read about ayahuasca as an MAOB inhibitor. Yeah. Um, which is one of the ways that many antidepressants work. Correct. Um, but on top of that, what I found fascinating is I've been witnessing a parallel between um, infections in the body, uh -huh. specifically parasites, but also viruses, yeah. Epstein Barr. Yep. Um, even there, there's there's toxoplasmosis. There are parts of the world where there's this brain parasite, toxoplasmosis, uh -huh. like the what's responsible for the crazy cat lady. Yeah. Eighty percent of the people in certain countries, Brazil and yeah. otherwise, have toxoplasmosis. I've seen that study. And there's no way of addressing that. Yeah. There's there's nothing that shows that it gets into the brain and gets rid of toxoplasmosis. And um, I've seen time and time again when we address Epstein Barr, herpes, Lyme herpes disease. simplex virus, Lyme disease, which I have or had or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. Um, I was diagnosed in 2011. Uh -huh. Right. 
th these are challenging things to deal with. And despite all of the best herbal and medical tools, it feels a bit like you're on uh, a treadmill yes. or, or, or a merry-go-round yeah, where definitely. you get a little bit of an improvement, but then if, um, if it's not adequately addressed, which is most of the time, yeah. it kind of comes back. Yeah. And then you're on this this teeter-totter of like, yeah. I bring the infection down and the infection comes back and I yeah. bring the infection down. And ayahuasca, I believe, is one of the greatest tools at addressing a wide variety of pathogens. Yeah. Pathogens that downregulate our uh, the neurotransmitter production yes. and affect our sleep. We've had a client, Jessica Wilson, who started taking certain things for bacterial and viral infections. And because she was wearing the aura ring and tracking her sleep with sleep cycle, she saw her deep sleep improve 300%. Wow. And I think we're just scratching the surface on how much these low level chronic infections that many people have no fucking idea about yeah. impact our ability to get deep restorative sleep, our ability to produce feel good neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. And after the, the second ceremony, I looked at my brother, a big part of our mission is to help transform healthcare. Nice. You know, like, like you, yeah, cool. realizing that like, okay, this isn't working. Yeah, exactly. You know, or it's working for something. Yeah, yeah, but, but not like it should. Not like especially with the money being spent. Right. Yes, and um, and you you see how many decisions are made from a place of oh, yeah. financial yeah. rather than like what's in the best interest of the public. And I looked at my brother and I said, "This plant could put healthcare out of business. It could." And I said, "It could also put us out of business." Yep. Because it's just it, it's 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 a true biohack. It's a true shortcut it is. to achieving a, a, a higher quality of life and a better existence here. If you look at like the indigenous populations throughout the world, and you go in there and if you study like you know what's their health like and what's their their uh, cholesterol like and all the different kind of markers that we're used to looking at in the West and like. They're like super healthy people on all levels, emotionally, physically. There's all this stuff, and everybody's like, "Well, you know, they're just not around all the all the risky stuff that we are." And you could, yeah, true, but they also have these indigenous plant medicines that are keeping them healthy and knocking out stuff and not have. You know, you won't find a, a schizophrenic in the Congo. You might find somebody that has. Uh, you know, again, it's the way it's defined in society, of course. Mm -hmm. But that person in the Congo or in Peru, an indigenous culture, is considered a, a shaman. Mm -hmm. And the way they view those people and the, the, the connection they allow for everybody to have is super healthy. And so just the way that people are living, they're using these plant medicines, it's, they're, they're super healthy people. Mm -hmm. What's a story that you find yourself sharing more than any other about how plant medicine has transformed transformed someone's life. Wow, there's so many. There's so many. There's so many. I think like uh, we've had a lot of people come here that were su actively suicidal. They had attempts in the past. They were gonna attempt recently, and they had a moment of clarity and they saw our Rhythmia web page or they saw something. And they came and they're like super hesitant. You know, they're here. They do our check-in, with medical check-ins we do with everybody. And, you know, we know their medical history. We've talked to them a lot before they get here. And then we do a session with them and figure out what's going on. And they're hopeless. And they say, if this doesn't work, I'm going to kill myself. Yeah, they have all these reasons why. And a lot of them are really bad. Re you know, they're, they're under a lot. You know, they, their life is a disaster. And they're just, they're just really sad, you know. And I had this one woman recently come who was committed to killing herself. Like, I'm gonna ice myself for sure if this doesn't work. So I said, all right, do you trust in me who you are as a person? She said, nope, I don't trust myself or anybody else. I said, all right, go up there and trust that medicine because that medicine is gonna help you trust yourself first. And then once you trust yourself, you can start to trust other people and you're gonna be able to decipher who's gonna hurt you and who's not. She's like, no way, BS, you know, whatever. Didn't believe me. Went up there, did the first ceremony. It was rough. I mean, she had a lot of physical things, a lot of purging. She comes back, talks to me. She's like, this is BS, you know, I just got sick. This is stupid. I said, all right, what are you going to do? I'm going to leave. I got my flight. I'm out. 
I'm like, all right, see you later. So you're just gonna let me go? I go, well, that's what you wanna do. This is about your own empowerment. You feel empowered leaving? Well, I don't know. And then we talked it through and she stayed. She did it again. And every night it got better. And suddenly she just had this breakthrough where she realized who she really was as a person. And she was an empath. And she had been absorbing tons of energy from the world her whole life. Energy that was really negative because she was in a chaotic environment growing up as a little girl and as an adult. And her role was to make other people feel better. She just didn't even know it. So she was just holding all this stuff for people. So she had her own issues, but she also were those were compounded by all the people's energy she was picking up on all the time. And she just thought it was her. So she was at the end of a rope and then what I call being flooded emotionally. So she got all that baggage off of her. And now she's like, it's hard to even explain. She's so happy. Suicide is not even on her radar. And she's out there talking to people. She's totally engaged in her job. She's back with her husband because they were going to get divorced. Like all this cool stuff. I see that a lot here. Mm -hmm. That kind of scenario. That's a little bit more extreme because of the suicidality stuff. But I see that theme happen here every single week. I've experienced some of that. Like one of one of the hardest moments of, of truth that I'd ever experienced was I was a, a, a freshman at the University of Illinois playing soccer and there was this guy who was like hyper masculine. Brett Cook, he was a fifth year senior, uh, like six five alpha. center defender. Uh, you know what I mean? He, he was he, he talked like this, he walked around like a peacock, and we were doing a, a shooting drill, one practice. He looked at me and he was like, Anthony, you know something? You're a good guy, but you always act like you got somewhere better to be. Uh, and I was like, interesting. at that point, it was like the harshest shit anyone's ever said to me, Yeah. because it just <laughs> cut right to the core of my soul. And I was like, that's not at all the type of person I want to be. Yeah. Like where I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding people and connection yeah. and, and, and just being present yeah, wow. in, in the moment. And I, then I started noticing how many times I avoid the pocket, the pocket of like eye contact yeah. and like giving someone a hug or I'm, I'm, I'm doing something that's like cutting myself off yeah. when, when that behavior is only perpetuating more of the, the feelings that I don't value. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and just being here, I'm, I'm catching myself. If I go there, I'm like, put your arms down, hang out here yeah. Yeah. for an extra second or two. Like yeah. it, it, it's safe. Everything that you want can be experienced if, if you're willing to just kind of connect Absolutely. A little bit more with the people around. Oh, yeah. And it's such a nicer way to be. Yeah. It's happier. It's more real, you know? There's yeah. nothing wrong with it. It's something that it's people want in their life. They just don't know how to get it. For sure. Yeah. Well, let's take a quick look at some awesome biohacks that All have right. made this show possible, and then we'll come back with a rapid fire round. Sounds good. Nice, man. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're back. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Dr. Jeff, do you take any supplements? You know, I used to take uh, like some whey protein. Yeah. <laughs> but it just would make me bloated. So now what I like is a totally different stuff. I just like B12. Yeah. B12 is really good. Good stuff. And sometimes like 5-HTP uh, is good. Yeah. I like that too. It's like a natural sort of mood enhancer. Oh, the, whole, the whole foods one is those, good. Those are two of my favorites as well. Yeah. I got the uh, the B12 lozenges that are like methylcobalamin, adenosylcobalamin, yeah. and, uh, and, and methylfolate. Oh, nice. You just let them dissolve under your tongue. Yeah. I notice that my mind feels sharper. My mood is better when I take those. And 5-HTP. Yeah, like, I love that. Sleep a little bit better. Totally. Your, your mood's a little bit more elevated. Definitely. Great, great calls. <laughs> um, what movie or book changed your life? The Autobiography of Malcolm X. Oh. The book. Yeah. The movie was good, but the book did when I was a kid. The movie's a Spike Lee joint, right? It is, it is, yeah. it is. He did a good job. Yeah. But I read the book when I was about 14. And what I used to do, I'm kind of a nerd, like every summer I would 
go to the library and just pick like one subject for the summer and just get every single book in there I could find and then just read them all. And one summer I picked Malcolm X because I'd heard about him in school. I read all the books and the autobiography of Malcolm X was super life changing for me. And the reason is because he had all these different transitions in his life. He would get new data and he would incorporate it into his life and change. And so like, you know, he, when he was like, uh, you know, he used to be a drug dealer guy and he went to prison, then he became Nation of Islam, then he was like super militant, then he got some more data and then he like shifted into like more of a, like a loving approach for everybody. And, and so like, I just really respected his process and I loved it. Because you know, oftentimes when we get into our older years, we're rigid, I, at least I thought adults were, because I was 14 when I read this book, right? So I said, I never want to be rigid. I always want to be flexible and I get new data and I change. So that was why. So yeah, autobiography from Malcolm X. That's cool. <laughs> I mean, we're probably on some level talking about synaptic plasticity. Definitely, yeah. same sort of vibe. How do you get motivated? Every day, I wake up, I see my kids, and I go for a surf. That's what does it for me. Because my surfing is my meditation. That's my time to plug into me. And my kids are so awesome. You know, I have four. I love them, they're amazing. And they're the best. And my wife, of course, is a huge part of my life. And my family, my friends, and I just love being around the people I'm around, you know, in my family. And I love to surf. And that's what gets me motivated to like go through the day and work with the guests and manage the staff and train the staff, yeah. If you're on a desert island and you've only got an iPod with one track, uh, what song is it? DMX, We Bout to Blow. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see that coming, but I like it. Oh my God, did I, uh, the, that first no, DMX album? No, good. Whew. Number two song, Ben Harper, With These Hands. Great song. Great song. Oh, my Two Hands, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I heard that dope. when I was studying abroad in Italy. That came out in like 2003. That's a good song. And yeah, I fell in love with it. Yeah. Great picks. <laughs> <laughs> what, who's your celebrity doppelganger? Uh, Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> and I don't think that of myself. That's just what I've been told. Yeah. All right. Nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Three things you can't live without. I can't live without sushi. Mm. <laughs> Can you get sushi in Costa Rica? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. It's All pretty right. good. Nice. It's not like the good stuff we get in LA. Yeah. It's good. The fish is good here, but... The, it's not like that Fukus, Fukushima sushi? They don't know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> sushi. Exercise. Yeah. I like the battle ropes. So oh, yeah? So sushi, the battle ropes, and... Rape. Ooh, yeah. Rape. We've been starting the night with some rape. <laughs> I'm definitely going to be getting some of that. Rape is awesome. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's. Um, yeah, I was talking with Brody, and and he was describing the way that he uses rape, mm -hmm. and it's like he's like when my mind is going in a lot of different directions, I'll get some rape. Yeah. And so for the people listening who aren't familiar with rape, maybe you can give them just like a quick. Yeah. It's a shamanic snuff, and it's, yeah. it's, it's tobacco-based, but it also has some other herbs and, uh, not chemicals, herbs and, herbs and spices. Yeah. And it's made in the, in the indigenous tribes make it, and it's really good for you. It's like tons of antioxidants. You know, people hear tobacco, they think, oh, it's bad. Tobacco is bad based on the route of administration. So smoking tobacco can be bad for people, of course, cigarettes. But tobacco used as a snuff in the raw hay with these other herbs and these other uh, plants is super grounding in it, and it, and it opens up the nose. I haven't gotten sick in so long, you know, because I do rape regularly. Mm -hmm. It just keeps you focused and clear. Yeah, and it's really cool. It's a, it's a plant medicine. Yeah, it's a, it's like it, before the rape, the mind. Yeah, and it's just like, yeah, everything. Yeah, kind of, focus. Yep, yeah. focus. Yeah. Uh, what's the most embarrassing moment of your life? Huh? Huh? That's a good one. I was teaching chemistry at the University of Hawaii Lab High School. So it's a high school that's attached to the UH. And I was the, the 11th grade chemistry teacher there at Glenda to Hawaii. And um, my kids were all, in the, the reason it's a laboratory high school is because they had kids that were developmentally delayed 
all the way up to genius level in one class. So you had to teach based on everybody's ability to learn. So that was really challenging, but super cool. And this isn't gonna sound probably that embarrassing, but it is based on if you know Hawaii and you know the Hawaiian kids, because there's something over there, there's, very, there's an Asian influence, it's, like, it's called shame. Like you don't wanna be embarrassed, like especially as like the teacher or the kapuna or the parent. You gotta maintain like your composure. You can't really like get to the level of the kids so much. I mean you can, but you're in charge and you're the one and you're supposed to be like, you know, keeping everybody in, in line, right? And the Hawaiians are Hawaiian kids are awesome. I did my dissertation on Hawaiian kids and addiction. But anyway, so <laughs> I, I was sitting up doing a lab experiment and I sat up on the on the the counter and I was talking to them and teaching them and, and I s and I fell backwards into the big chemistry sink, like a big deep basin, <laughs> and my legs were sticking straight up, <laughs> and my head hit the back of the sink, and it would have water in it about this much, so I'd come out and my whole butt is wet. That was my most embarrassing moment. <laughs> That's a good one. That good. I never heard the end of it, even to this day. Yeah. They still talk about it, and they're calling me. My students, yeah, and they're, now they're in college and they're older, right? Oh, Still talking about it. That's great. <laughs> what makes you cry? Huh. Seeing my kids asleep because they're so peaceful, it just makes me cry. Like not out of sadness, just out of love. You know, when my kids are asleep, they're just in such peace. They're such angels. You know, even the ones that are older. I just see them asleep and it's just like, there's no barriers or nothing, it's just them, you know? And I see that and I get tearful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Last question. Someone listening to this interview who has suspended disbelief long enough to get to this point, yeah. what would your recommendation be for, you know, they're, they're potentially open to the idea of plant medicine but they're not sure. Okay. What would you recommend is the next thing that they do? You know, I think for, for somebody to really look at themselves and say, what do I want out of life? Do I want to move through life with the current coping mechanisms that I have? And are they serving me? Or do I want to reevaluate what those coping mechanisms are and maybe get some new ones that are healthier? and do some soul searching. And don't think about the shamans and don't think about the facility and don't think about even the plant medicine. Just be like, what do I want out of life? You know, what's my purpose here? Because I believe our purpose in life is to be happy and connected to other people in a way that's healthy and to have success in the ways that we view success to be. And if I have all that, then cool, you don't need plant medicine. But if you don't have that, the next step can be plant medicine to help you get those things in your life. This is great. Thank you so much. Dr. Jeff, where can people follow the work you're doing and uh, explore some of the options available to them? There's, uh, there's two really kind of good ways to do it. Uh, the Rhythmia Facebook page, it just Rhythmia on Facebook. R-Y-T-H-M-I-A. R-Y. And we'll link to it in the show notes. Perfect. Yeah, R-Y-T-H-M-I-A. And, and then uh, I do a Facebook Live every Monday evening, Pacific Standard Time, 6 p.m. And those get put after they're on our Facebook page, they get put over to YouTube. So if you just type in Dr. Jeff Rhythmia in YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, 80 to 100 videos will come up. And mine are short and sweet. They're 10 minutes. Talk about psychological stuff, medical stuff with plant medicine. And people find those to be pretty helpful because I just get right to the point and just help people kind of understand what's going on here and, and the struggles they're having in their life and it just focuses on that. Beautiful. We'll, we'll link to yeah. the, the, the phone number to Rhythmia and uh, anything that, that people, you know, any, any places people could go to awesome. explore some of these things. Sounds Thank good. you so much for, Thank you. for what you guys are doing here. Thanks we for appreciate coming. you. And, Thank you. Uh, Pura Vida. Pura Vida. <laughs>